Hello. Good afternoon. Welcome to our afternoon cuppa. It is nearly the end of the day. And if you've got this far, hump day's over. We're nearly to the weekend. Thank you for joining. My name is Debbie Forster. I'm the CEO of the Tech Talent Charter, and I'm welcoming you to our Inclusion in Tech Festival. Now, for some of you, you've been here since the very start, and thank you. Thank you for staying for all those sessions. There might be a few of you, according to my signups, that suggest that we've got you coming in for the very first time. So let's think of a few things. We are the Tech Talent Charter. Today's festival is really going to be focusing on practical insights. If you've taken the time to join us, we're committed to leaving you with some actionable insights. We focus on the practical and we focus on connecting the dots. So you'll be hearing from real employers talking about how they're tackling driving the challenges of EDI within their companies. We want you to feel that you have an involvement in this. We want you to be part of the piece. And we, we know that our signatories are a big part of how we're able to do what we do. We're also grateful that we have our sponsors. Beasley is the sponsor, the headline sponsor for this event. They've been great partners in planning all of the content across the piece. We also rely on some fantastic partners, principal partners who've invested us from the very start. So HP, Lloyd's Banking Group, PwC, Nominet Global, and the government's Digital Culture and Media and Sport Department, the DCMS. Right. In the old world, in the 3D world, I'd be up on a stage, I'd have one of those funky Madonna microphones going on, and I'd be giving you those logistics. This is the fire exit, here are the loos, there's the coffee. What I'll do very quickly is to give you a run through what you have on the screen here if you're a newcomer. So on the screen that I'm on right now, this little orange box that I live in, if you look down, a ribbon should pop up in it. You can turn it on to HD to broadcast in full definition. And I know everyone's enjoyed watching every wrinkle and freckle going across my forehead. There's also a box that means you can turn on closed captioning if that helps you take part in the event today. And I do want you to take part. We've been really fortunate. Every one of our sessions has had loads of questions coming in from the audience. So if you look just below my screen, there's the box where you can start asking those questions. If you already know you came to this event with a burning question that you want answered, start dropping that in now and we'll prime that to go to talk to our panels. We also, a little further down, if you missed yesterday, sometimes you'll hear us referencing some of the great work discussions that we had yesterday. I don't want you to miss that. So you see below where you can scroll back and watch yesterday's events, you'll hear us referencing our annual report. This is a report that we publish each year. To join the Tech Talent Charter is free, but you do give us key core EDI data on gender, ethnicity, and your big problems and what's working in the space. We turned that into a report that was published last week. We discussed it in yesterday's sessions, but you can still have a link below to have a look at what it, that report is and to measure yourself against how the rest of our signatories are doing in this space. You also have a chance to do something on social. Some of you on this call today have already been sharing on LinkedIn, Twitter, on Instagram or Facebook, what's mattered, what's resonated for you from this event. Or if you still have a burning question that you want to do, do feel free. We'd love if you do share with us on social. We want to keep this conversation going. Right, and logistics, apparently. Now we've had the odd session where someone couldn't get sound, et cetera. And apparently from time to time, my internet's not as good and I go a bit fuzzy. The team would tell you that that's also what happens when I don't have enough caffeine. So apologies if it happens, I'll try and keep my broadband functioning and my caffeine coming before we go into today's session. Now, the charter, I was thinking back, this is our fifth festival of some sort. Back in 2018, our second event, we met back in the Gherkin, and that was the first time we started talking about alternate routes into tech. And by that, I mean apprenticeships, returners programs, cross-training, upskilling, any of those alternative routes. And that was when we first started talking about how could we make that work? And it was new and it was different, but some of our signatories were making that work. Roll forward. COVID has shown us that every company needs to be digital, and that has meant that the need for tech talent has never been greater. And it also showed us that a lot of people 
were in jobs or careers that were not stable, were not sustainable for them, and they're looking to change and get in. So this is a point in which, as Winston Churchill says, never waste a good crisis. We in tech can lean into this crisis and we can use that both to get us great talent and diverse teams to really innovate, and we can make sure that we help people get back to work. So to hear more about that, we're going to hear from a range of our employers who are doing a lot in this space. And this is going to be led by one of my TTC directors and someone from our great partners at Taito, Rebecca Donnelly. Over to you, Rebecca. Thank you very much, Debbie. Um, good afternoon to everybody joining us for this um, session, in particular to our panellists. Um, yes, my name is Rebecca Donnelly. I'm a director at the Tech Talent Charter and a senior partner at tech PR agency Taito. So we heard from um, the Secretary of State, Nadine Dorries, earlier on in her opening video at the start of today's sessions about the importance of building digital skills capabilities across the UK. And we're seeing organisations increasingly, as Debbie mentioned, look outside the normal routes to identify, recruit and train new talent. And this has obvious potential benefits for attracting more diverse talent as well. And we see the government investing in digital skills boot camps, third party organizations such as Institute for Coding and Tech She Can, placing specific focus on bringing talent from underrepresented groups into the industry. Um, however, in this year's Tech Talent Charter annual report, 58% of our signatories told us that they are not currently running any skills or careers initiatives designed to attract more diverse talent. So in this session, we're very fortunate to be joined from speakers by a range of organizations who are investing in alternative routes to share with us some of their insights. Um, we do, of course, want to get your questions to them as well. So as Debbie mentioned, if you scroll down just below the conference scene, you'll see a Q&A box. So please do put your questions in there at any point during the conversation and we will um, address as many of them as we, as we can through the conversation and at the end. Um, but first, I'm going to ask by asking our start by asking our panel to introduce themselves very briefly, um, so we can dive right into the discussion. Maya. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, excellent. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Maya Brotonevich, and I'm director of engineering at Booking.com. Thank you for having me. Diversity and inclusion is a major focus for Booking.com, and I'm really, really happy to be taking part in this session. Thank you very much. Sheridan. Hi, yeah, I'm Sheridan Ash and I wear a couple of hats. So I lead technology innovation at PwC in the UK and have and led many of our women in tech initiatives over the last sort of five to seven years. And I'm also the CEO of a charity called Tech She Can. And Tech She Can is all about creating initiatives and pathways into tech subjects and careers for girls and women at all the sort of really important moments that matter in their lives. Thank you. Gori, I'll come to you next. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Um, hope you can hear me as well. We can. So, yeah, fantastic. So um, I'm Gori, Gori Hire. I'm the founder of Upskill Digital. Um, so we're a learning organization uh, that builds learning programs to help uh, employees and, uh, and prospective candidates have the confidence that they, they need in tech skills to be able to get into organizations. We also <laughs> Uh, run a digital academy uh, where we place uh, diverse tech talent into organizations as well. So I'm super excited about this conversation. Hopefully uh, we can talk about why it's so important to focus on alter alternative routes into tech. Thank you. Absolutely. And um, last but not least, Sarah. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, apologies in advance for being off camera. Um, but as this has been recorded, I do have to stay hidden, um, which is not great in this virtual world. So apologies for that. But I am here behind my little avatar. So yes, yeah, so Sarah, um, I work for the National Cybersecurity Centre, which is part of GCHQ. And for the past five years, I've had the pleasure of leading the Cyber First programme. So our programme is all about um, seeking to create and support a future diverse workforce that sort of got the necessary skills and knowledge to keep the UK secure and resilient to current and future cyber threats. So we do have a key focus on diversity as part of all that. And I guess, as, as you can probably imagine, future cyber threats um, is a massive thing at the moment in this uh, really uncertain and scary and worrying um, times. So it's something that's very important to us at the moment. So we have a whole range of things that underpin the programme, but I will talk to you more about that um, as we go through the programme. 
We will. Thank you so much. Now, hopefully, Juliet will be back with us in a few minutes so that we can involve her in the conversation. Um, but we will we will crack on regardless. Um, and I think when Debbie gave her sort of initial remarks at the start, she mentioned some of the different alternative routes that are, are being explored by employers, such as returners programs, apprenticeships. Um, Maya, I wanted to come to you first because at Booking.com, um, you invested in a number of these different initiatives. Yeah. Um, can you explain um, yeah. What have been your key successes and learnings from some yeah. of these programs? Okay, thank you, thank you, thank you, Rebecca. So over the past few years, we have, we at Booking.com have put a lot of lot of effort to grow our talent programs like apprenticeship, graduate, and tech returners to help diversity and inclusion. And we we kind of got a number of learnings, but I I will call out um, initially just two for now. Um, for any of these, for all of these programs to be successful, what we learned is it is important to make sure that there is a right support structure in place for these people on the program to be set for success. So we worked with uh, our managers and we worked with our learning colleagues to make sure these people have the right kind of the, the support structure, right development plan in place to help them settle into their roles. With that said, we also recognize that it was very, very important that we also support our kind of teams who are onboarding these people. So it was the kind of the, the learning that we need to provide the support all around from the candidates and the people you know, on the program also for our teams as well. The second learning um, that I would like to mention is about the a program being targeted. With our tech return, with our first tech return program, um, we had a blend of people um, who were returning and who were retraining. And um, where, while it's, this was a interesting and useful to have that rich variety of the skills and backgrounds and the kind of uh, uh, transferable skills, it made all this supporting model quite kind of uh, intense. So, so with, with that said and with that learning, we decided for our second uh, tech returner program, which is happening as we speak, and it's finishing in two weeks' time, to actually target with the with the being being returners only, which again will help the whole mm. this uh, you know onboarding, supporting, uh, and so on. So yeah. these are kind of initially my two key learnings. I mean, that's a really interesting point you make there because you know for anyone who's not familiar with kind of that concept of, of returners, the people who've had a significant period yes. outside of the workforce, and of course our minds sort of immediately turn to perhaps women who have. Um, been been raising a family and taking a few years out of the workforce but of course those aren't the only reasons that some people may may be looking to to return into the workforce after a few years out so it's interesting to say that um that that you've had to consider the different perspectives and the different situations of the the talent that you're trying to attract yes. to make sure that the program is tailored for them yes um, sorry to interrupt yes. no no go ahead yeah that's exactly because the first program was, to your point, returners who were per people with a you know career break, which, uh, uh, having a career break from tech industry. Then we had the per people who had some uh, who had a, a careers in the tech industry, but not as developers or testers. And yeah. we had then the third kind of category of the people who were just career break, uh, sorry, career switch. You know, working in a completely different industry, wanting to start the you know their career in in, in tech. That the every single you know of these cases required very tailored support to help them for success, to enable them to embed into the teams and actually be, uh, you know, kind of uh, happy in their roles in, 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 in our teams. Thank you. Um, Sheridan, I'd love to get your take because obviously one of the, the one of the initiatives that Maya mentioned was apprenticeships. And I know that's something that PwC have been using for some time. Can you tell us a bit about um, why, why PwC invests in this and what have been some of the challenges and learnings and perhaps how you're taking that into the work you're doing with Tech you Can? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, at PwC, I mean, I think we've got the classic problems that a lot of companies will have. We've had early pipeline issues. You know, there's very few um, younger women coming through from schools and colleges and universities. And then we also have the problem that it's quite difficult to get women back, just as we've heard after things like maternity leave or they've had um, some time out of the workplace for whatever reason. And it's also quite difficult to advance women. So while we've done everything we can at PwC to, to get those things right, and we've done a really good job, we've over doubled the amount of women that we now have in our technology workforce to sort of about 32%. Um, we still are having problems with those um, 
key issues, which is in effect why Texture Can was developed. Mm. Um, so if you think Texture Can, think of it as like it was incubated in PwC, but actually with 18 other organizations that were mostly our clients, but also DCMS that Debbie mentioned. So, you know, government um, support as well. And the whole principle behind Texture you Can was that, you know, we can't solve these problems on our own. In effect, we're all fighting over the same women. So if we come together and collaborate, what can we do for the greater good, if you like, to just enrich the pipeline at the early stage and at all those other stages I've mentioned? So in effect, if you like, PwC now works with TechuCam on some of the areas where we are still seeing major problems. So, for example, although we've increased um, at PwC the, the amount of women, um, we have very few black women in our technology workforce. So at the moment, TechuCam and PwC are partnering to and we've developed a apprenticeship program that is specifically going to be targeted at black women. We're also working with other organizations um, within the TechuCan family to look at bespoke programs that are focused on pivoters. You know, how can we increase the amount of women we've got in the workforce right now by taking women that maybe have lost their job during the pandemic and putting them through like level three or four software engineering or DevOps apprenticeships? where they get a job and they're literally training within a, a year's period and they're straight away in the workforce. Yeah. So those are some of the things that we're doing. And I think really interesting, again, you've made the point about the importance of taking a really bespoke approach and not, not just sort of implementing one program and expecting that to sort of work across the board. Um, but before we um, move on to explore that a little bit more, um, I wanted to welcome back Juliet. Juliet, can we hear you now? No, unfortunately, we still cannot hear you. I'm so sorry about this. Um, I do hope we can get that issue resolved for you really quickly so that we can hear hear from you because um, we're really keen to learn more about what the Bank of England has been doing with their returners programme. Um, but in the meantime, I'll come to um, Sarah um, next because we talked about a um, skills shortage in the tech sector. Um, there is a, a very, very real skill shortage in, in cybersecurity, particularly with very few women working in the sector. Um, Sarah, we'd love to hear more about what the National Cybersecurity Centre is, is doing to make a difference in this space. Yeah, so I can talk um, as a cyber first, and I'm actually I'm pleased to say that PwC are a very um, active supporter of cyber first. So that's great. And they've been hosting some of our web events, which is superb. So cyber first was primarily set up as um, a bursary programme, sort of looking to recruit um, future students um, to come into the cybersecurity sector and sort of help fill that skills gap um, as I talked about. And one of the things obviously is a great focus on diversity. So we've been looking having what can we do to encourage more women to apply and to join our scheme. So we've tried things like changing the brand to make it more inclusive, more attractive, more exciting and more appealing. We've changed the language in terms of how we do our recruitment adverts to bring on sort of the more nurturing side to sort of try and get more um, women to apply. And then we started off primarily the recruitment was focusing on students that had STEM degrees and STEM or studying STEM degrees or taking STEM A levels. But we recognised that maybe that was putting quite a few students off applying and maybe them feeling it was elite. Um, it was for the geeks and therefore it would put quite a few people off. So we've changed it now that the bursary scheme can be for any student studying any um, A-levels. They have to have three A-levels, and the, but they can be studying any degree whilst they're going to university. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But what they have to have is that natural passion and the natural curiosity to be able to, to want to learn. We can teach people cybersecurity skills, but they can't have that natural curiosity to, to want to do that. And through that, we have managed to attract more women onto the programme. Um, so we've got 20% girls on the program at the moment and 15% ethnic minorities, um, which is really positive. But we still know that's still not good enough and we still need to do even better. Uh, so this year we have managed to recruit um, and attract 50% females and 50% males onto the bursary program. But some of those women... Uh, some of those students, female students that are applying, haven't necessarily got the right technical skills that we need at the moment. So we're going to be running a two-pronged um, approach over the summer, yeah. where some of the students will get invited directly onto the bursary programme, and we're going to have another group of students who are all females, where we're going to give them a boost. 
So over the summer, we're going to boost their technical skills, boost their confidence. Some of them lack the, what we call them, the softer skills, or we now like to call them power skills in terms of how to do interviews, how to sell themselves, give them that inner belief that they can do this um, and it isn't yeah. just the boys. And then we get them to come on and join the bursary programme. So we're hoping if this booster works, that we can actually really boost the number of girls on the programme and maybe actually aspire to having a recruitment programme that brings in 50% boys and 50% girls. And if we can crack that nut, we'll be really sort of really pleased. And then that pipeline feeds into industry, government and academia. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have 170 companies working with us. Um, we're, we're not recruiting just for NCSC, we're recruiting for right. NCLC. So, so that's how Cyber First is the bursary programme. And then we have a load of other activities whereby we have an all-female and um, an all-girls competition, which is aimed at year eight girls. Um, so that's reached out to 60,000 girls. So yeah, focusing on the much, much younger, much younger end of the pipeline. And that is very yeah. much about encouraging those girls to make the right choices at GCSEs, working with them so they can make the right choices at A-level, and then obviously going through to university yeah. if they want to do that. Approaches yeah. are absolutely amazing as well. BTECs, T-levels, there's all sorts of other things out there. Well, can I come on to um, can I come on to Gory? Because I'm really I'm really interested to hear sort of a broad perspective on a lot of these different initiatives that have been mentioned. So, um, Gory, you you um, represent Upskill Digital, who worked across a lot of these different programs, and you're now one of the government's um, skills bootcamp providers. Um, what advice can you give to the audience listening today on, on how to how to choose from this kind of myriad of different options, how to decide what's right for them, and how to sort of start going about implementing a, a, a initiative like this? Sure. Um, well, as you've heard, there's a multitude of options out there. Um, and I think what was interesting is Maya mentioned it, and, and I think also Sharon did, did as well, which is the importance of making sure it's bespoke to your organization. So it tailors to the needs of your organization. So there's a couple of things to think about. I mean, firstly, defining the timescales, um, depending on the role that you're going for and the needs of the business. You need to understand, you know, how quickly do you need people to come into your organization that have a specific set, set of skills? So mm -hmm. when do you need people to be deployed in particular roles? So if it's data roles, for example, you know, do you have eight to 12 weeks to wait till they come in or do you need to bring them in immediately and then actually train them on, on the job? Um, so asking yourself those kind of questions is really key to work out what kind of program might be right for you as well. Um, you know, if you have got the time to wait, then that's fantastic, but also understand the depth of knowledge that you require from these individuals when you're going through a particular program. So so um, I think so. Uh, Chad mentioned about some of the the career changes. Uh, you know, they they have perhaps a, you know a longer need for reskilling to ensure that they can switch from 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 one role to the other. So what depth of knowledge is needed for them when they come into that role? Do you need somebody with a particular set of skills that's going to start the job ready? You know, in in which case you're thinking about apprenticeships. You know. Can you afford the amount of training that's going to come alongside this and, and ensure that they're ready for uh, for the role perhaps in a year's time or in six months time, for example? Um, and what does like entry level really look like for you? So you, you've really got to have a think of those kind of questions. I'd also recommend identifying skills gaps within your organization. Um, some organizations don't have the skills to identify the gaps or the tools to right. identify the gaps effectively, but it is useful to, to make sure that they're looking at this as well. And then your, your final part of the question was, how do they make sure that it works for them once they've got the program? And um, Maya mentioned this before, which is about the support piece. So regardless of whatever program you do, once they enter the organization, you have to make sure they're supported. Um, and that's absolutely key. So everything from mentor, sponsorship, development plans, how do you ensure that these individuals that might have slightly differing needs as, as diverse individuals, those needs are catered for. Um, you know, we focus a lot on the inclusive hiring piece, so that um, you know, once they you know have made it through the candidate pool into, into the organisation, that biases have been tackled, and hopefully, their onboarding strategy means that they're actually supported into the organisation, so they can actually thrive when they get there. Um, yeah. Because you don't want to invest all this time into getting somebody and then realise that actually they're not going to stay. Um, so yeah, those are a few things to, to consider when you're thinking yeah. about the kind of programs. A, a really good final point you made I think it came up on an earlier an earlier a panel discussion about um the importance not just of focusing on recruitment right that you know once you've brought on great new talent you need to make sure that they get the right support to stay um we're getting some brilliant questions in from the audience and please do kind of continue to get your questions in there I want to kind of start coming to a few of them in a minute if we can um first of all I wanted to see whether we are able to speak to Juliet let's give it let's give it one more shot Juliet are you with us 
No, unfortunately, she's not. So sorry about this. I'm not quite sure what what technical issues are going on there. Um, but we will um, we will keep going and see where we can get to. And um, one of the questions. Oh, she's back. Should we give it a go, Juliet? Yes. Can us? you hear me? We can hear you. Yes, it's a miracle. Great. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Great. Um, I Sorry was about that. Just, that's absolutely fine. I was just um, encouraging the audience to send in their questions. We've had some really good ones that we're going to um, come to in a moment. But I wanted to just give you the opportunity to introduce yourself um, finally. Um, and we, we've been talking about a number of different initiatives to attract um, talent in from alternative routes. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about what the Bank of England is doing specifically and how it's going. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry I missed what everybody else uh, was talking about. So I'm sure it would be really interesting to hear. Um, but I'm Juliet, uh, Juliet Bryan. I work in um, technology at the Bank of England um, in um, workforce planning and strategy roles. So I'm heavily involved in resourcing and recruitment for, for technology. And one of the things I was going to talk a little bit more about was um, the returners programme that we've been doing for the last um, last few years, last um, three years in particular, this is something we've been doing in technology. It was actually piloted in a different part of the bank originally, and then we decided that it would be a good way to um, to attract more, more women in particular into technology um, and also to fill some of those uh, resourcing gaps that, that we had and, and difficult to fill roles and some of the sort of skills, you know, shortages and challenge, challenges we've been talking about more recently. Um, so I'll just talk about some of the things that kind of went sort of went well, and then I can maybe just cover some of the things that we learned from it as well, so yeah. you can get a feel for, for that. Um, because the programme was initially sort of designed for quite a different sort of skill a skill set at, at the bank. It was um, to recruit um, supervisors, and then when we were trying to adapt it to technology, there was a few things we, we learned from that as well. Um, it was a six month um, fixed term contract that was that was offered, and we were looking for experienced uh, professionals with um, a, a gap a career break of at least two years or more um, and, it, and also with some coaching to support them in getting back into the workplace that was just a brief overview of the program um, what we found what was really good was that we got we got some good people out of it and um, so in total we had this is not just technology all across um, the bank we've had 76 returners that have come through um, 91 percent of those were female but what we also found was they also attracted a diverse range of candidates not just um not just in gender so we had 49 percent that were um, BAME um, uh, candidates as well so um, and that's that that, that was the, the proportion of the people that were actually hired from the program so it was ethnicity as well as as gender and also you know people who maybe had career breaks because they'd had um, health um, issues or all kinds of different reasons so generally good for you know diversity um, across the board uh, and we got really good people, really experienced people. One of the things we realised is that the people who came through the programme would get up to speed really, really quickly. We needed mm. to kind of make sure the programme allowed for that. So um, we weren't hiring too much on kind of a very, you know, separate route that would take them a, you know, a long time to get to the point that their equivalents would have been who'd, you know, who, who were working as experienced hires. Um, and we've had good retention from it as well. I think one, only one person through, from the technology route um, actually didn't stay at the end of the nice. fixed term contract, and that was sort of a mutual decision because of the the role um, yeah. wasn't wasn't right for them. Oh. I wanted to pick up on one thing you said particularly because we've had a, a very relevant question in from someone in the audience um, who says a lot of this sounds very junior focused. Is it possible to train someone into a senior tech role? Do the panel have any examples of this having worked? And and I was about to ask that question of our panel, but you specifically mentioned there that part of your program has been about recruiting more senior returners and, and talent. Um, what What's the kind of the split been and have you found that more challenging or less challenging than more junior roles? Yeah, I mean, I think historically we've, we've kind of had quite established program, junior programs into, into tech at the bank. So the, we've had apprenticeship programs, uh, which were originally school leavers became apprenticeships and early careers. So I think this is a way to, yeah, to kind of bridge that, that gap. I think where it's been um, maybe a bit more challenging in terms of where to pitch the roles is because we've been looking at people with professional experience, people who've worked in these fields before, albeit having had a career break. Um, and then actually what we found is very quickly they've been able to move into a position where maybe they're ready for actually a more uh, more senior role once their kind of confidence has you know got, got back to to sort of the levels maybe that they were at before and they're they've maybe you know filled some of the gaps in what they might have missed in in their kind of skill set and in that kind of career break time so what we what we learned quite quickly is we needed to make sure that when that person came off the program maybe not right away when, when they came in um, into a permanent role that we needed to be able to promote them um you know we, there needed to be sort of career paths and routes to be able to sort of move them into um into those kind of more senior roles if they're ready for them yeah. um 
and to yeah to, to not sort of hold them back by the fact they kind of yeah. came through this this route um I mean, some of the other things as well, we, we sort of learned from in particular is to make sure that we have got those budgeted roles available at the, at yeah. the end of the programme. Might sound a yeah. sort of basic thing, but, but um, you know, think about the sort of time of year we do it and do, yeah. we, have, do we actually have the roles available for them to go into um, when they finish absolutely. the, the programme. Um, so that, we, you know, we have that, that kind of that messaging, making sure they have the right environment to go into. So they do need, you know, there's different levels of support and making sure that, you know, they're working with supportive um, managers and teams and uh, they're not thrown into a, onto a highly stressful yeah. project for us example um, I think that, that's a, that's a really interesting point about about kind of internal perceptions and I, I definitely want to come on to that but I wanted just to put a quick question um, to Sheridan if I may we've had um, we've had a question in from the audience um, saying a lot of this sounds um, very kind of focused towards large companies and I think you know most of you on the call today do represent large companies but you're also working on initiatives that do support smaller companies with this how can smaller companies that don't have the resources to create different sort of bespoke programs how can they um, invest in returners programs to, to bring in or, or any kind of programs to bring in bring in talent well because we saw this as a, a, a real problem amongst our members at Tech She Can. So we've got about 220 organizations as members now, and, and they are huge organizations like the PwCs and the Tesco's. Um, but we've also got some small organizations, you know, like an AI startup. So one of the things that we're doing is we're facilitating sharing the levy. So there's a levy system that big companies, I think it's any, I think it's anything over 50 employees that you, you either have to use the money to, on apprenticeships as you lose it type of thing. It's like a tax. So basically what we're doing at Tech She Can is we've got big companies that can't use all their levy and we're able to share that levy with smaller organizations. So if you are listening and you're a smaller organization, please do get in contact with us because we can train your, um, we can get you apprenticeships and provide the training as long as they, you've got a job for them at the end of it. That, that was back to, uh, to Julie as well. Um, yeah. Sarah, do you, have a, do you have a perspective on this question as well? Yes, yeah, so I was just going to say that we've got quite a few SMEs that are part of the Cyber First programme and obviously they can benefit by um, having the students work with them over the summer, so eight week to 12 week summer placements and if they like them then potentially can maybe offer them jobs at the end of it. So it's all funded through the National Cyber Security programme so there's no cost outlay to any of the SMEs, it's just finding those work roles to be able to work with the students over the summer and then they're part of a community as well so they can learn from what other SMEs are doing in that space. So. If any of you are a SME and would like to be part of that community, I know it's cyber security per se, but it is sort of technical skills and we really welcome them as well. So that's quite a nice opportunity for any if they're interested. Thank you. Um, I wanted to pick up on something that Juliet was saying earlier about um, making sure that you have the right support systems in place um, when you bring people back after a gap or when you bring people on through apprenticeships. Um, and we actually had a, a question in from the audience asking about about exactly that sort of perceptions of people coming into organizations from these routes. Um, and Gori, I wanted to ask for your, your perspective on, um, on the learners and the people who kind of go through the, the boot camps and um, get placed with different organizations, um, how you feel um, the perceptions of those people is changing. I think it's changing qu quite a lot, actually. I mean, I, what's interesting is some of the initial boot camps that you know we were running sort of, uh, sort of back in the day, I think a lot of people thought that they were primarily enabling those with stronger tech skills already to access careers that needed them to hone their skills and add more as top ups. And actually what you're finding now is more and more programs cater to those that have very little tech skills. Perhaps they could be, you know, uh, humanities graduates or career changers or those mm -hmm. who recently were pursuing brand new opportunities. And it's opening up a new world for those individuals to feel that they can start almost from scratch. Um, you know, tech programs are taking people on a more sort of longer, more personalized, more detailed journey. Uh, and I think that's really helpful for those who feel supported throughout this as well. So the impressions of, of you know, what, what this can do for you um, and what kind of pathways it can open, it's really starting to change. Um, again, you see more, more, more programs that are focusing on you know, helping sort of uh, women get into tech roles. Um, incredible to hear Juliet's have, um, uh, you know, stats of 91% of women that are going through the roles. It's fantastic. I mean, it's just the way that they're attracting more people and using the right terminology and 
um, you know, advertising campaigns that really attracts more people is, is key. Um, and again, I'm just, you know, we're seeing many more programs that are, 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 are exciting more diverse and marginalized groups uh, and that's that's really key from, from our perspective and, and again like you know there is i think it was something that either sheridan or, or maya said about uh, sorry i think it was sarah that said it about um you know the the the, the sort of eligibility to get into these programs. If it's a STEM career and you're coming from, you know, you know, you don't just need to have a university background, right? You can be A-levels at a minimum, for example. I think just opening those programs up, I mean, we, our programs are, are, are very open. We try to get people who are from, you know, in marginalized communities, but we go to the harder to reach places to make sure that they really have that access into these into these kind of programs and mm -hmm. support them all the way through the journey. So the impressions of these these programs are changing because they're becoming more accessible. And you know, I think they they're feeling comfortable that they, they can be part of the future uh, sort of tech workforce. And I think that's that's really key. I think that's that's a really good um a really good point that you've kind of got the the, the double edged thing. You first got how how people on returners programs coming through boot camps, how they're perceived within the organizations they're going to, but also how those opportunities are perceived by the talent. And I think there was something you said earlier on, um, Sarah, about um people getting put off by certain types of language being used in adverts. Um, is there anything you've learned about how to how to make make your opportunities more accessible and more attractive to people from, from underrepresented groups? So I think it just goes back to what we've said about the language. And so we have um, tools that will test the, the language that we're using. And we'll also have like pilot groups that will test any adverts that we're putting out, whether that be from a gender perspective or an ethnicity perspective. Mm -hmm. so we're really keen to make sure that the language is right and it's attracting and also certain roles. Gory, you talked you talk quite a lot about roles and we do know that certain roles, and I'm coming at this from a GCHQ perspective, um, certain roles in GCHQ will appeal to some sectors more than others. So if we, if within GCHQ, it's very much about protecting the nation, keeping people safe, and using that type of language we have found is far more appealing to um, the female sector more necessarily than some of the boys who might want to become, look at the ethyl ha hacking, um, sort of offensive cyber type things as well. So it's trying to understand your audience more and then tailoring the language um, to suit that audience. And we specifically have different roles when we're looking at maybe sort of um, labs and things. You have to go through some technical labs, but they'll be synced to certain roles. And we have found that the girls will definitely go for different roles in the labs within that role. The labs are all the same, but they've just come in through a different route. And we see that sort of 60% of the girls will apply through that route. And then the boys will come in through a different route they come out exactly the same at the other yeah. end, it's just what's attracted them at the beginning. That's a very interesting direct comparison you can do there, looking at you know how how the how the language makes such a difference yeah. um, for the same opportunity. Um, Sheridan, what's your perspective on this? Well, the thing that started Tech You Can off was a piece of research that I commissioned. Um, you know, we surveyed about two and a half thousand young men and women that were either sort of probably between about 16 and 23. So A-levels going to colleges, universities, or straight into the, the, the work place. And some of the key differences, it's like what we got from the, the young women was how they choose a subject at school and a career is understanding how it has a positive impact on their life, their family, their community, the UK and the wider world. And they don't get the link between technology and that. They get the link for biology because they get doctor, mm. nurse, and I have to go through this training to do that. So what we've tried to do with our materials at the school age is we teach, we, we talk about how is technology used to solve the environmental problems? How is technology used in to have fun? How is it used in sport? So we talk about how technology is used to have a really positive impact and solve important problems. And we provide them with relatable role models. And by that, I mean young role models, not Ada Lovelace, who's been yeah. dead for a long time, <laughs> or Cheryl Sandberg. So a lot of the work we do at the early age is around that sort of language. Yeah. But then we've taken that into the work we do around work experience, career insights weeks that we provide, and also the apprenticeships. Thank you. And um, Juliet, did you have something to, to add to this, this topic? 
Yeah, I was just, I was just um, going to build on some of the points then, um, that, that Sarah was mentioning earlier around the sort of language in the job specs, where um, we've also been we sort of used a similar tool um, to, to the one you're describing that, that looks at sort of the, you know, the gendered language and, and what language mm -hmm. comes to different mm -hmm. ages, but also about the, you know, the, the, the actual, the role, you know, what, what we're actually advertising. And I think this is something we initially sort of were, were um, challenged with the returners program when we're advertising when we're advertising for the roles what what are we actually what is the actual minimum that we need the minimum competencies that you know that, that we actually need to be able to sort of train somebody for them to kind of be upskilled like do we really need somebody with you know at something that's quite recent um and then applying that that what we learned actually from doing the returners program to some of the other kind of um you know, more experienced type of equipment where we're saying actually we did bring this person in they didn't know about this, you know, this thing that we always put on our job specs and actually that, you know, then we can apply um, apply that to some of the other um, recruitment that we're doing as well and be a bit more open about, um, you know, those bringing people in internally, who externally rather, who don't have that, that experience and internally and, uh, you know, internal needs as well. Um, yeah. And I think the sort of outreach is one sort of changing the you know one of our challenges is changing the perception of the Bank of England as an employer for technology and you know some of the outreach we're going out to those kind of you know girls' schools and um, university events that are focused on women in tech and things like you know trying to kind of um, you know sort of change that 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 perception and getting to them getting to them early I guess is is uh, some of the things that we found yeah um, you know to be sort of to be helpful in, in that respect. Absolutely. And I think that's something that's come up a few times times on this call. Um, one of the questions from the audience I wanted to come to, and we do still have some time if uh, we want more questions in from the audience, please do send them in. But we do have a few that I'd love to tackle. Um, one question that's just come in, do you think there is a danger of these types of routes being stereotypes to marginalised groups, but there will remain a prestige and elitism around, around computer degrees? Um, and Gory, I wanted to get your take on that, but before I hand over to you, um, we did actually have some some data points from the Tech Talent Charter report this year, um, looking at um, perceptions of of people coming in through boot camps, and actually eighty three percent of respondents who'd used these said that it was very very successful or successful or very successful. Which, building on what you said earlier about perceptions shifting to be more positive, I think does does show um, that perhaps perhaps maybe this is a myth that needs busting. What what do you think? Yeah, I, I look, it's really, I'm so thankful that the report is able to kind of highlight things like this because the, you know, I think there was a big, there was a big piece in the report that said there's still quite a few employees that are not familiar with the, the bootcamp concept and, you know, are still trying sort of getting comfortable with it. But those that are familiar with it, do you prefer it for the model? What is interesting to me is the perception of this bootcamp learner who comes through there is more of a need to support them through the organization. And that actually changes the mindset of a lot of our, of a lot of employers, which means, you know, can I support the learners that are coming through into our organization more, more you know, with, with more, more resources, more mentoring, more development plans. And I think that's just important for all employers. Um, you know, the reason retention rates are so high is because, you know, many employees aren't looking at how they support people into the organization. I think all this does is give them more of an onus on, focusing on, 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 on the level of support that they need and being aware of the level of support needed for diverse talent. And I think that's really, really important because that often is, you know, been an afterthought for many organizations. I think if anything, it's the perception is not that they just need more support, but that all employees need, uh, all employees, you know, prospective candidates need support. How do I adapt my organization so that we can mm -hmm. support in the best way possible? I think it's really, really key. Um, I think uh, the, so. The other sort of, I think the other question you asked was about the elism around. Yeah, yeah, that was the question we had in from uh, the audience. Whether 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 there almost be a kind of a two two tier um, or different perceptions within organisations, and that kind of people doing engineering or computer science degrees will sort of somehow have more prestige, and 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 how what organisations can do to tackle that. I mean, it's about the caliber of the candidates. Um, you know, if we have candidates that are coming through a boot camp and they don't come in with a seat with a, with, with a degree, but they have like um, like Sarah mentioned, the curiosity, the cognitive flexibility to learn more on the job and be more engaged, um, then you know the proof will be in the pudding. It'll show the difference yeah. between the two. And I don't think those CS degrees are going to be the things that employers are specifically looking for. Now there is a a mindset shift for employers to start to pull away from needing degrees 
more specifically and actually thinking what can they do to help uh, to help sort of open the floodgates to, to all candidates from all different backgrounds and just know that you have those that are um, you know keen to learn have that curiosity I mean in a lot of the programs that we run uh, you know data analysts data engineers cloud architects mm -hmm. we actually do a level of testing beforehand to see you know what is your aptitude to learning you know you know right. how curious are you um, cognitive flexibility we do a lot of those tests to make sure we we know that they can use that information in their interviews and say you know this is this is my approach and this is how I'm going to be able to thrive in your organization and really bring you um, you know yeah to the best of my abilities um, yeah. so yeah I think you know if anything we're trying to to, 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 uh, to really pull away from this elitist kind of view which and actually you know help employees just to open their candidate pools you know make them more open which is key um, and, uh, so if I can uh, build on uh, what Corey yeah. said, uh, uh, based on our experience with the apprenticeship program, for example, which we started a few years back with just primarily focusing with the people with no experience whatsoever and no degrees and kind of uh, targeting the, the, the grassroots entry kind of uh, options. And that was quite successful. However, with this uh, tech returner program that we have uh, started running a couple of years ago, we uh, kind of realized that we should expand our apprenticeship program to, to the people with the career change, which again, will not be coming from the with the, with the you know uh, computer science or the stem degrees and again uh, we recognize that this is a quite powerful kind of approach to bring these people with uh, you know different degrees or with no degrees degrees at all so uh, so i feel that these these alternative rules are very important and one interesting uh, kind of the the, the 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 metric from from our for example from our side is that in our apprenticeship program, 50% of apprentices that we put through this program are females. Fantastic, thank you. Um, we have a few more questions to get through from the um, to get through who have been sent in by the audience. Um, not too much time left in the conversation. So we had one earlier, but I think it would be really interesting just to sort of put to the panel because one of the things that I've I've kind of seen from this is that there are so many different things you can do and so many different options um looking at you know that the early pipeline how you engage at all these levels but i think there's a definite sense that that it's a challenge to know where to start um so i'd love to hear just from our panel just quite quickly what are your kind of three top tips or your kind of key no-nos to watch out for if you're an organization who really wants to wants to, to, to branch out in terms of how they find their tech talent and, and, and start bringing on different types of talent. Anyone wants to kind of jump in with their, their three key learnings? Shall I pick someone? I, Sheridan, Sheridan. I knew you were going to pick me. <laughs> I was practically scrambling at the back of my head trying to think of what these three were. So number one, contact if you can. <laughs> Um, you know, we'll, we'll help you um, navigate it. And I think that's what I would say it is quite complex out there. Um, I think one of the biggest learnings that I've ever had is that this idea of making sure that you understand your data and the gaps that you've got. So what are the what are the types of people that you, you want to bring into your organization? And what are the actual skill gaps you've got? And, and you know, even if you're a small organization, you, you can look at, around and see that and be able to get that information. Um, and I think the thing is, for me is, you know, there's the attraction bit, but then you've got to retain so you might do, you know, you've got to do all, get all the, the, the basics right in terms of attraction, but it's no good then if you get them in and you don't do all the right policies and the work-life home balance and all of those things because you won't keep them. And then you have to think about how do you advance people, particularly if you're focusing on, on specific groups. So for me, it's, it's sort of those things really. So work with third party organizations. Do a collaborate skills, with others yeah do a skills gap audit and focus on retention as well as attraction yeah um anyone else in our panel would like to like to build on that uh, so yeah. i would like yeah oh we're all fighting for help me for each other <laughs> Juliet, do you want to jump in? Yeah, yeah, great, thanks. Um, so I was just, just a bit on um, what Sheridan was saying there around the, 
you know, making sure that they have the support to be successful when they're here as well. And also, you know, one of the things that we found with some of these programs is, is that it's really important to, to make sure that the person, that's, the people that are managing them, will be involved in the in the attraction and recruitment bit, rather than sort of having this, you know, recruitment program that you're pulling in people in from. And then the managers maybe aren't on board with the the flexible working that they might need, or, or whatever it is, and then making sure that you have that involvement with them at, at the um, at the early stages, so that you know they they understand the support that that the people would need. Um, that you're bringing in through, through different routes um, and I think it's the, the change in mindset as well um, so it's a bit of an education piece for those people who are hiring and managing as well to make sure that they um, you know kind of can break away from maybe the way that they've done things previously and um, and be um, you know more open and flexible about about the background or, or the skills or whatever it is that, that people have um, that are coming into that organisation um, when, and you know when you have more successful examples as well, then you have those kind of case studies and can kind of promote those case studies as well and those successes um, within the organisation. Absolutely, Those are my points. Absolutely, I'd love to continue with the top tips, and I'll come to you next, Gory. But perhaps you can also um, help us with another question that's come in. Um, what can be done to help boot camp apprenticeship entrants overcome a sense of imposter syndrome, which can arise um, when they're working with with peers who perhaps come in through more traditional routes? Um, that's a good question. I mean, as we know, we have whether it's career changer or somebody's brand new to the, uh, you know, to to to, to the topic. Um, imposter syndrome is rife. Um, we're, we're all familiar with it. We're very used to it. Um, you know, also if you feel like you're stepping into an industry where you don't see many people that look like you, um, you know, so it can be it's very worrying. Um, you know, look from from our perspective, when we're running some of our programs, we try to have our coaches that are from a diverse background to help people feel more comfortable with some of the projects that they're, that they're working on, the, or the uh, topics that they we're training them on as well. Um, we even have a program that's called Own Your Difference, which really focuses on helping you feel more comfortable about what makes you different and how do you shine when you get to an organization. Um, you know, the fact is some of these tech pieces or these these sort of areas of technology that um that we are training people on um it might even be quite new for the organization who's bringing you in on this which is why they want to kind of hire people in that know their stuff so we all have imposter syndrome it's really important that you can feel you can make the learners feel comfortable so employees have a job to do to say you know what like you know you you're, you've learned it you're here to practice on it and let's just make sure that you can feel supported in there um you know and 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 for learners I, I think it's just it's just important to be able to hopefully you know get some support from other individuals whether it's a mentor or somebody that you can reach out to that can support you on your journey that can give you the more more confidence that what you have learned is something that you do know and that you can put into practice when yeah. you get there so it's always a big question of imposter syndrome, but you know, for our perspective, it's it's about empowerment and, and support. Yeah. And I think it's right what you say. Um, we all have imposter syndrome <laughs> to some extent, don't we? Um, did you have any other kind of key top tips you wanted to 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 throw in there in terms of what organizations need to think about before they approach one of these initiatives? Absolutely. I feel bad going before Maya or Sarah, so I'll just get quick with mine so I can get them out of the way. But um um actually there's there's a couple a few things for me. Firstly, if you're going to go into any of these programs, um, to make sure that when you do bring people into the organization, if they're being interviewed or engaged with you know, any of your talent acquisition professionals or recruiters, is invest in inclusive hiring techniques, actually training those that are at the forefront of um, those interviews, hiring managers. You know, We do a lot of training around inclusive hiring, and what we find is that many individuals in that space aren't aren't supported in terms of how they tackle their bias. Um, so, you know, you don't want to invest all this work in getting people to the door and then realize that they're going to get turned away because somebody hasn't had a crack at that yet. So inclusive hiring, inclusive onboarding, think about that first. Make sure that you're set up to, to allow people to come in. Uh, and then again, with the onboarding piece, make sure that they can thrive when they get there. Um, I think the, I think Juliet mentioned it perfectly, which is the manager piece. So actually consulting those people managers that will be supporting those individuals when they get to the organization is key. If you can, you want to make it feel like you're almost co-creating the program with them, mm -hmm. um, so they feel like they're really fed into it because you're about to take up a lot of their time with getting somebody in their team that needs to be supported. So how do you ensure that you can help them, you know, in in that area as well? And then yeah. the final piece, which is fairly simple, which is I guess almost demystifying those roles. Um, Sarah talked about the, some of the inclusive language in the roles, which is key. Um, you know, having a think about that. There's some really amazing free inclusive language checkers um, that you can use online. You just post your job ad in there, and it'll just you know you know go through and work out which terms are um, more favorable towards or so, certain genders or not. Um, so have a, have a little think about how you can um, make them as inclusive as possible. The job ads um, and ensure that there's tools and, te and technology out there that can help you do this as well. So just a few things to think about to really help those floodgate truly open and you know give those people a chance to shine when they try to get to the door of your organization. 
Fantastic. Thank you. Maya, what have, what have we missed so far? Notes that I put have been already mentioned, but <laughs> what, what I would like to kind of say, it's super important for these programs to be successful, not to be run from top down. It need to be inclusive. It need to be kind of part of the culture of the in and the teams being involved. To Gori's point, with the onboarding, with the interviewing, with all the way through, you know, the teams and the relevant teams. One one thing we we learn from uh, from the past is that it can't be generic. You know, you dedicate the team where the, the you know the where the individuals are coming so that they are engaged with them from the very beginning to mm -hmm. the very end uh, and and as i said it's this whole kind of the model of supporting structure you know to have in place to organize how do you do communication how often do you check with your with the people who, you know with the with the with the uh, members that you are onboarding uh, what is their feedback how do they feel you know so i think it's important to be that two ways uh, kind of dialogue and listening uh, how successfully the program is going and the comms as i said the comms are very important with the uh, uh, with the kind of uh, uh, members of the the uh, return group or the or the training group and with the um, uh, teams that are involved yeah absolutely and lastly sarah coming to you for any any of your key top tips or things to avoid so i think for me in terms of that early pipeline it's start early um, we've all talked about you know, engaging with um, students at a younger age. If you can start talking to them about the roles or your organisation or the sector at an early age, that's key. And also don't forget those key influencers. Get out to the parents. You know, the parents are the ones that we realise have massive influence over mm. what student, students make from a choices perspective. So if you can engage with both parents and students, that's really, really key. And then in terms of our own organisation, as a government organisation, we can never compete with industry from a salary perspective. So it's all about that value add proposition. What is it that yeah. we can offer that industry can't? Um, it, for us, it's protecting the nation. Not many other organisations can do that. So it's sort of it's selling on your values and your ethics. Yeah, and that's a really key part of that uh, recruitment proposition. Fantastic. Well, we are um, very nearly out of time, um, but I wanted to, I've just been listening to all of those, all of those tips you all shared, and I want to just recap on them and um, make sure we haven't missed anything so that everybody listening has got some really tangible things they can take away. So um, hopefully these are vaguely in the right order. So starting early, engaging with the talent pipeline early on um, to, to encourage people from all different backgrounds to, to consider careers in tech, work with third party organisations, collaborate, get support. There are plenty of organizations including some of the ones we've got on on the session today who are are able to help quite small organizations to activate some of these initiatives um do a, a skills gap audit so you know exactly what you're looking for and then invest in hiring inclusive hiring techniques so support your hiring managers with training demystify the roles use the kind of the values and what you can achieve at your business to help sell those roles to the talent you're trying to attract um, then, of course, once you've attracted them, focus on retention, make sure that you've got the right policies in place, the right onboarding, that you're training your team to offer the right support, working with manager, managers, um, making the whole process inclusive so that you're not trying to force it through. Um, and then celebrate the difference of your team members, showcase your success studies and provide mentors and role models so that people can really see their future within an organisation and not, not just kind of, we've got you through the door and now we're going to forget about you. Um, incredibly valuable advice really helpful and brilliant to hear directly from some amazing organizations who are putting this into practice and hopefully that was valuable for everybody listening today um, thank you all so much for joining us and i am going to hand back over to debbie